Are we live? Are we live right now? Are we live, Serge? I don't know. Are we live? Are we live? <laughs> I can't do this. I can't do the eye raise for too long, man. Though the, I gotta, I got, I gotta respect. I gotta respect my man for the eyebrow game. Hmm. Anyways, we're not, we're not here to talk about eyebrows. It's been a while. It has been a while. It has been a while since I streamed. I was away, uh, saving the world. And uh, I couldn't really do much. As you can see, uh, the markets are plumbing. You know, the world is still in a crisis, but uh, I delayed the ending of the world. So you should still take me. And it's been a while since I've streamed, so I might be a little rusty. I might not be super efficient in my explanatory powers. If I'm not, you gotta have to forgive me for that. And it's probably gonna be my last stream not ever, but my last stream doing kind of these like very high quality detailed talks. And I'm going to probably stick to PowerPoint and that kind of stuff. And really, the reason is because I still have to, I still have to prepare uh, a lot of my evidence and my notes. And I, I'm just thinking, why don't I just do it in PowerPoint? You benefit from it. I benefit from it. <clears throat> it seems like just the most efficient way to do things. So we're going to probably see the return of PowerPoints. <clears throat> soon but streams are probably still going to be on where i'm going to try to talk about things in in like a more semi-serious manner so we can en engage with the with the chat and what people are saying in the live chat and, and so on and so forth but having made those preliminary marks we're going to be talking about as you, as you can see in the title this is going to be about the filioque and you can kind of uh maybe guess that is this some kind of like a response to someone like what's going on um I plan to do it like that. I planned a response, but then I thought, you know, the why instead of responding, why don't I just dedicate the first like 10, 15 minutes of this video just making the Roman Catholic case for the filioque? I think that will be a lot more simple because a lot of these arguments are just people restating the position. A lot of these arguments is just people not telling why they make the moves on like their beliefs. They don't make it. They just say, for example, like a classic argument is scripture says that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. So uh, that's a relation. And only, you know, uh, you know, if it's a relation, then it has to be filioque. So actually filioque is in scripture. And, you know, that these kinds of arguments, you know, they don't tell you why they make that move. They don't tell you why that supposedly proves the filioque. But I will do that. I will tell you why. I will tell you why they make that move. And so the first, as I said, 10, 15 minutes is going to be, I made, I basically made like a speech here. I wrote something here. And this could already be an article by itself, but I already wrote something here uh, where I pretty much am going to be giving the Roman Catholic argument based off of some of the arguments that I had with people, uh, some of the articles that I read uh with relation to this issue and even some of the you know some biblical verses and statements from thomas aquinas in the summa this is going to be kind of like a summary into why the filioque is a necessity in roman catholic theology and then after that we're going to get to the point of dissecting these arguments we're going to dissect these arguments and we're going to show at the end of this video hopefully uh you know but by, by the time that this video ends Hopefully you're still alive. Hopefully you're still awake. By the time this video ends, um, the goal is going to be to establish the case that filioque leads to moral collapse, or in other words, filioque leads to the originist problem. So what are we not going to see in the stream? You're not going to see quote minds. There's going to be quotes, but are we going to see like 20 quotes from different fathers? trying to prove my point and like no like we're not gonna we're not doing quote minds here if you want to see quotes this quote from the church no what we're gonna do is that we're gonna i'm going to be giving to you the mindset in order to understand what the quotes are saying right so i guess you could say that this is education 
right? I'm gonna give you a proper education to understand this issue because most of these people, they don't wanna do that, right? They wanna stick to their very smart ivory towers. I'm really smart. I'm the smart guy. You're gonna listen to me because I'm the smart guy. We're not doing that, okay? We're gonna be giving you the, the foundation to understand what this debate is about. I already have different videos. I have multiple streams. A lot of people are focusing on the short video I did that became really popular. The, why the Orthodox Christians reject the filioque. That's the, that's the one that blew up. So a lot of people are focusing on that, but they don't realize, dude, I have much more detailed, like that's not my most detailed analysis of the filioque. That's not, not by a long shot. Uh, I have a two hour stream on this topic, for instance, that you can check out as well. It goes into the history and the theology of it, but we're going to be specifically focusing on the theology. Part of the reason is because the history is actually really simple. Um, like from a historical standpoint, there's actually really no justification for the filioque. And uh, I will probably make a stream or a PowerPoint presentation on the kind of effects of that. I do believe, for example, that the filioque did allow for uh, some kind of questioning of Christian dogmas in the Western sphere. And that has led to liberalism, that has led to questioning Christian doctrines and dogma and tradition, which has led to, you know, Protestantism and then to atheism. I do think that kind of a mindset, the kind of mindset that, for example, the Carolingian theologians had, the post schism West had in arguing for the filioque, I think it really opened the door for a lot of the stuff that we have today. So I do think, you know, some people say, you know, make fun of, oh, you know, Filioque ruined the West, like, as, like, making fun of us, but it, it literally did, I mean, it's, um, it literally kind of did, I mean, you make the same argument against Protestants, where they say, oh, you know, these, these people are questioning things that normally shouldn't be questioned, and why don't they just affirm these things, well, you did the same exact thing, dude, because at the end of the day, from a purely historical standpoint, you look at the ecumenical councils, what do they say, it doesn't have the addition, right, um, and if the creed is something that we can make clarifications over constantly and constantly, well, then there's just no end to it. Then we could just make, let's just make more clarifications. Let's just add that the Virgin Mary is Theotokos. I mean, these true, these are correct things, but it kind of violates the purpose of the creed, right? It violates the purpose of why we use it, why we have it in the first place. If we can just modify it or, you know, if you want to prove that it's a, it's a living creed, well, you prove it by being a living church. How do you become a living church? Well, by, um, by having autistic idiots online talking about theology on Twitter, no, uh, you have saints, right? <laughs> so that's how you do it. But anyway, that's enough preliminary remarks we're going to be talking about. And again, before I move on, um, I'll probably make the notes. I'll publish it on Patreon. If you want to support me financially or whatever, if you want, if you want to ask me questions in the stream, we will be looking at super chats at the end of the stream, okay? If you have questions, if you want to stump me, this is your chance, okay? Give me money and you can stump me, right? <laughs> Super chats will be answered at the end of the stream. If there's something I said that you didn't really understand that you need clarification on, I'll try my absolute best after I'm gassed out from the stream. It's probably gonna last for like two or three hours. So um, let's begin by, again, as I said, let's begin by making the Roman Catholic case for the filioque and showing why it's necessary. And one of the things that you're going to notice is that you're going to see that even if you don't agree with the system, well, everything logically connects with each other, right? There's a, there's a real logical connection with a lot of these arguments. Um, and you can start to understand why some of the Roman Catholics that you have talked to online that you seem, you know, so it seems so bizarre. You'll start to understand, well, why do they say those kinds of bizarre things? And it's not because, again, it's not because... Um, it's not because of some like kiddish reason, kiddish, which is not a word, but whatever. It's like, oh, because their beliefs are silly. It's because no, there is an actual logical process and an actual logical development over time. It does take place in the pre schism West, but as I've shown in the stream on the Filioque's history and theology, which was a two hour stream, um, really the pre schism Filioque, if you can even call it that, is actually different from the modern dogmatic Roman Catholic filioque. And that's kind of a bold claim, but it actually is different. There's a, and St. Maximus' letter to Mary, this is one of the biggest proofs. So again, we're going to be talking about it as well. So there's going to be a lot of things that you're going to hear in the response, things that I talked about before, right? But 
All right, let us begin with the arguments. The Roman Catholic case for why the filioque is necessary for a correct understanding of the Trinity. The Roman Catholic will say that since God is simple and since God is divine and he is one and we understand distinctions to be opposition, well, Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all one God. They're all identical to the divine nature, right? So God here will mean divine nature. Uh, but the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're not identical with each other, right? That's the heresy of Sabellianism. And so there is a distinction between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, how can there be, in a simple essence, distinctions? Um, Thomas Aquinas says, Origin includes the idea of someone from whom another comes and of someone that comes from another. And by these two modes, a person can be known. So the relations of origin or the relations of opposition, whatever you want to call it, this is how, in the Roman Catholic system, one can distinguish between the divine persons. And these relations, because personhood, because personhood is relation, right? Um, the Through the relations of opposition, relations of origin, one can come to understand the three persons and distinguish between the three divine persons. And so for there to be a trinity, and this trinity to not be separate, there needs to be a connection between all of these persons, right? So they, so you will hear Roman Catholics talk about the four relations. Um, there is the relations, but I'll, I'll basically couch it as this. It's, it's, it's a bit more simple. You have the Father, who is the uncaused cause. You have the Son, whose origin is from the Father, and He is the cause, cause. He's caused, and He is caused Himself. And then the, you have the Holy Spirit who is who originates from both. So you can distinguish the Father, uh, the Son, from the Father by saying that you know the Son has his origin in the Father, the Holy Spirit has his origin in the Father and the Son, right? And so through these different relations that these persons have with each other, you can pretty much establish the fact that yes, indeed, uh, there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And for the Holy Spirit to be distinct from the Father and the Son, uh, he has to have his origin from the Father and the Son, which means that the filioque is necessary for the Roman Catholic system. This is further argued from Scripture in various different scriptural passages. The, the, you know, you see arguments like John 20, 22, the, you know, that Christ breathes the Holy Spirit onto the apostles, Christ sending uh, the Holy Spirit um, onto creation. These are general proofs, but I think the kind of one of the main arguments that you hear as well is the statement "Spirit of Christ," right? Um, so John sixteen fourteen is uh, is an example of this. Well, we, we're gonna we, we might maybe look at John sixteen fourteen, but uh, the main kind of argument, for example, I want to use is uh, Galatians uh, four six, right? So Saint Paul says. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, right? Spirit of his son. So if the spirit is the spirit of the son, then that means the spirit is therefore also from the son. That's basically the argument. Um, and yeah, he shall glorify me, John 16, 14, he shall glorify me for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Right. Um, there's, you know, other verses as well. You have Romans against Spirit of Christ. The general idea is that since the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, that is establishing a relation between Christ and the Holy Spirit. And since the only possible relation within the divine persons in the Trinity is relations of origin, this relation has to be a relation of origin. So even temporal relations has to be an eternal, based off of an eternal relation of origin. This therefore means the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but also the Son in the Roman Catholic view. That's pretty much how they uh, understand this. This is why they think these verses prove the filioque. Even John 15, 26, kind of, in fact, technically speaking, can support filioque, but Again, John 15, 26, how then can the Roman Catholic understand certain verses or patristic quotes where 
the Holy Spirit seems to just proceed from the Father. Well, the general argument is that it doesn't say alone, right? So it just says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. So that could be understood that the Holy Spirit principally proceeds from the Father as the uncaused cause, but the Father, it, but the Son is the cause cause, right? So although the Spirit proceeds from the Son in the Roman Catholic view, because it principally proceeds from the Father, you know, it's correct to say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father according to the Roman Catholic view. I just want to say that because I'm streaming and someone might join the stream and think like, isn't this guy Orthodox? Why is he saying the Roman Catholic points and say they're correct? <laughs> um, I, don't want to, I don't want to make people uh, misunderstand what is being said here. Uh, and oh, I already got a super chat as I saw. Uh, thank you, Pano, for the five dollars again. I'm gonna read it, but uh, yeah, I, oh, I actually that's an argument that I kind of did plan to point out. But if I if I remember and if the super chat stays, I'll probably go back to that point. Um, but to to go back to what I was talking about again, yeah, this pretty much gets into what I was trying to talk. And so once the Roman Catholic understands that. The Roman Catholic then looks at some of the patristic quotes where, you know, it seems to be the case that only the, you know, the Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. But then, you know, Bessarin of Nicaea, for example, says, well, the Father said the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son. Um, the true indicates that the Son is the cause cause, right? But from in this context indicates that the Father is the principal cause. And they will say, you know, this is in St. Augustine, which it is, you know, it, this kind of distinction, but um, uh, this is kind of how they understand these anti filioque verses. This is again one of the reasons why the filioque proof texts really they're not going to prove anything, to be honest, right? They might prove to a certain point, um, you know, establish something, you know, a point that th these statements are normal, but if you don't understand what those statements mean, then you kind of you just end up being in a dead end, right? So they will use, for example, St. Kirill of Alexandria saying that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Father, as well as of the Son, and comes forth substantially from both. That is, from the Father through the Son. So the Roman Catholic looks at that statement and says, that's the, that's fully okay. There's a relation between the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's a relation of origin. The Holy Spirit has origin in the Son and the Father. Fully okay, right? So that's a fully okay statement. Uh, for a Roman Catholic. What does that mean for the Orthodox? Well, they don't care about what we mean, but we're going to be talking about that in the refutations. Uh, they will then use St. Maximus' letter to Marinus. St. Maximus pretty much confirms this. Yes, St. Maximus does say that the Father is, you know, the, you know, he does seem to say that only the Father is caused, but really what he is talking about is being uncaused cause, right? So that's what the Greek sense of cause or aitia, that's what it really means. Aitia just means uncaused cause. So once we understand it that way, it thinks the Roman Catholic, this means that the son can be also caused. It's just that he's not an uncaused cause. He's a caused cause, right? That's the difference. But he is still caused and his causality is from a single principle uh, from the father, right? So there aren't, in, there aren't two causes. There's one cause, the father and the son together. And you can already guess that. And if you read St. Photius, you'll see that St. Photius pounces on this and, and pretty much annihilates this this kind of view, but, um, you know, the Roman Catholic will then point out, well, Maximus, you know, in his letter to Marina says the Latins are correct. There's documentary evidence from Latin fathers and even from Eastern fathers like St. Kirill of Alexandria. So it seems like St. Maximus is saying that the Filioque actually was Orthodox all along. If you, you guys love the, love St. Maximus so much, why don't, why don't you believe in the Filioque like St. Maximus does, right? Um, well, again, we can basically say, well, you, lo you like St. Maximus so much. Why don't you accept essence energy's distinction, St. Maximus? But there's actually starting to do that now, Roman Catholics, right? They're actually starting to get into that kind of theology. So this is why the Roman Catholic will say it's not an addition. It's a clarification because when the creed says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, really, it's talking about principal procession. But the and the Son clause clarifies that it's the principal procession and the Spirit and the, and the Son, sorry, is, you know, is cause cause so that's how they understand in their mind that the filioque is merely a clarification not an addition right um one of the things that again they will say saint Gregory theologian says that the son has everything from the father except for causality so that means they will say again 
everything for well causality here means being uncaused cause right so the son doesn't he doesn't get being uncaused transferred to him because it's just intransferable but being caused they will say that's transferable right and therefore son has the ability to cause and so he can cause the holy spirit it is pretty much again the roman catholic interpretation of these statements it pretty much depends on the greek sense of the word cause it has to be it has to mean being uncaused cause <laughs> cause I'm, I'm using this word a lot but um pretty much the best way i can have this presentation uh so, all right so the principle of this procession is God's nature. According to Ludwig Ott in his Principles of uh, Catholic Dogma, I believe, um, he says the Holy Ghost proceeds from the will or the mutual love of the Father and the Son. So that we understand then that the Holy Spirit is will, that is love of the Father and the Son, and is their common bond, right? So this is kind of, again, um, there are some Western theologians that kind of couch that way, uh, Carolingian theologians especially, they pretty much said that the Holy Spirit is the common friend between the father and the son in fact there's a um in a certain roman popular roman catholic apologist defense of the filioque he actually quotes a, a page where it uses this analogy as a marriage right so uh just like how the father and the mother have a relation with each other and a son is produced from it right so they, that's kind of how they couch it so the son is the kind of common bond between the love of the father and the mother Right, so that's where Panos super chat kind of comes in. It's like, you know, is, it, is he just a friend or, you know, what's going on over here? But uh, uh, to to kind of get get to what we are talking about here, um, the Holy Spirit can be understood as the principle of you, you know the basis of unity and love of the Father and the Son. Again, he's their common friend, right? Um, So this strengthens this further strengthens the idea that the Trinitarian relations are relations of origin. Uh, some argue that this means that the Spirit is a product of God's will. That is not the case. This is simply a description of the Spirit's hypostatic mode of existence. Since persons are relations, the relation of the Spirit and the love between the Father and Son is love. The Spirit is, so to speak, love from love, right? Um, so the Spirit is not a result of God's ad extra will, because that will mean he is created, but he is a result of the ad interval, which Thomas Aquinas says that, uh, why am I getting messages during a live stream? Smiley face. Uh, let me get to this point. All right. Yeah. In, in his Summa Contra Gentiles, Thomas Aquinas says, oh, this is quite small, but, you know, uh, the object of the divine will is the divine essence. Therefore, his will is his essence. From this, it appears that God's will is not other than his essence. And I can assure you, this is not him saying, um, like saying the objections, right? <laughs> this is him in his replies. So, uh, I believe this is Summa Contra Gentilis chapter 73 and 74, where, you know, this is pretty much, uh, the object of willing is the divine essence and essence and will the divine will they're both identical they're both considered the same uh where was this all right <clears throat> so it is the essence he will say basically that uh, that it is the essence that produces the holy spirit and so this is why it's not arianism it doesn't come from an external add extra will add extra will that's what creates things so then how do we answer some other potential objections from the orthodox says a roman catholic well for example the orthodox talk about the hypostatic properties so did the latin fathers for instance saint fulgentius of ruspe if you read sienzinski's book he talks about this saint fulgentius says the hypostatic property of the holy spirit is to proceed from the father and the son and you know he's an orthodox saint so um you know that's that's an argument he uses they say that since the property of the Father is to be caused, the Son cannot cause the Spirit. Um, St. Photius says that this means semi sabellianism but that doesn't make any sense because, again, we distinguish them based on the relation of their origin, and the Son has his origin in the Father, but the Holy Spirit has his origin in the Father and, and the Son. And the Father does not have any origin, right? He's unoriginate. Um, in all senses, whereas the Son and the Holy Spirit are unoriginate with respect to crime, time and crime, time and creation, 
right? So, no, there's no confusion between the persons, the Roman Catholic will say. The Orthodox also, and then this is kind of like the attack. Well, the Orthodox, they, they just don't have any connection. There's no connection, no relation, no eternal relation between the Father and uh, between the Son, the Holy Spirit in Orthodox Trinitarian theology. They reject the filioque, so it's only the Father that causes the Son, and only the Father causes the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Son does not cause the Holy Spirit. So how is there a relation between the Son and the Holy Spirit? Well, there obviously is. Um, for example, the uh, the Son, again, the 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 Son Himself says, and Saint Paul in Scripture says that the Son is that the Spirit is of Christ. If the Spirit is of Christ, then there's a relation there. Now it has to be a relation of origin. So there has to be a filioque as a Roman Catholic. Uh, the Orthodox cannot establish an eternal relationship between the Son and the Holy Spirit for this reason. So they don't, properly speaking, have a trinity. The Orthodox also say that the Father is the only principle in the Godhead. So what is the principle of God's actions at extra? So, you know, is it also the person of the Father or is it the divine nature? If they say it's the divine nature, then there logically, you know, can be one principle, even in the Orthodox view, there can be one principle established by multiple persons. So this Fodian argument about, you know, communion of the Father and the Son together that excludes the Holy Spirit, that's just bunk, right? That just doesn't make any sense in the Roman Catholic view. Roman Catholic will say, that doesn't make any sense. You don't need that, right? So... Many persons can be one principle. So the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit are one principle when they create things. And therefore, you know, the Father and the Son can be one principle too. How's that denying that there is one principle at the end of the day? So in short, uh, to kind of summarize and recapitulate, in God, persons are relations. And as Thomas Aquinas says, there it says how there's a real distinction. Thomas Aquinas says, hence, there must be a real distinction in God, not indeed according to that which is absolute, namely essence, wherein there is supreme unity and simplicity, but according to that which is relative. So the persons are relative. So although the persons are identical to the essence, they're not identical to each other because they are relative. Therefore, God is a trinity and the filioque is a necessity. This is the pretty much the Roman Catholic argument. This is the, the way I want to demonstrate for this, uh, for this stream. Let's see. Uh, um, okay, well... That's what the message was. I thought it was something exciting. Anyways, <laughs> so how do we how do we start with looking into this? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read through the argument again, but this time I'm gonna be doing a point by point, you know, refutation, right? So let's start from the beginning again. And again, you know, this this will probably end up. You know, because I do have notes, I have, you know, screenshots and citations and etc. But I'm probably going to, maybe I might go off on a tangent. So, for example, one of the tangents I, I want to go on right now um, is at the end, you know, the the relative uh, absolute thing. Before I go on, hold up. <clears throat> it's kind of just ask, is God being a trinity absolutely essential to god you know um is god substantially a trinity and what is the what is the point of this question well really um what i have in mind is occam's razor right what is occam's razor the simplest explanation is the correct one no that's not, that's actually not what occam's razor is occam's razor is that plurality is not to be posited without necessity this therefore need means that God necessarily has to be a trinity, doesn't it? If God is not necessarily a trinity, and if Occam's razor is true, can't a Muslim just come up and say, well, you yourself admit that God's God being a trinity is not, it's something relative, right? It's not something absolute. Maybe Thomas in elsewhere says it is absolute. It's just, you know, within each other it's relative, but... It's absolute, you know, it, there's, that might be possible. The point that I'm, just a question that I want to raise um, is, again, if this is the case, can a Muslim just come up and say, since you say yourself that this is relative, um, then doesn't that mean that God being a trinity is not absolute? Now, if God 
is absolutely a trinity, then does that refute natural theology? I mean, one of the points of natural theology is that Muslims worship the same God as Christians, right? But it seems to be if if God's triune character is substantial to his existence, then it is substantial in all possible worlds. If it's substantial in all possible worlds, then it seems to me at least that it's very that's very much necessary to say that God is a trinity fundamentally and that therefore Christians do not worship the same God as Muslims do. It's just one of the questions that I have in mind. If you if you're gonna say, you know, again, the the other side of the problem is um you know getting getting felted by Occam's razor. <laughs> that's the other side of the problem. But let's get back to kind of the topic at hand, which is the filioque. But you can see that the filioque isn't just some simple, you know, word that just got added. There's a lot more into it. Uh, theologically speaking than that so let's start from the beginning god since god is uh and let me just look at how many viewers and likes we have. oh we got 50 likes 50 views very cool so since god is divinely uh simple and he is one real and real distinctions opposition the father son holy spirit are all, all one god which is the divine nature however the father son holy spirit have to be distinct from each other so as to protect the dogma of one God being three persons. This is done by establishing relations of opposition. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says, Origin includes the idea of someone from whom another comes, and of someone that comes from another. And by these two modes, a person can be known. And so for there to be a trinity, there needs to connect to be a connectivity with all the three persons. This is done so with the Father, who is the principal cause, that is a young cause, cause uh, the Son, who is cause, who is cause, cause, and the Holy Spirit, which originates from both. This is why the filioque is a necessity to establish these relations. So there's, again, four relations that Roman Catholics speak of, um, re relations of origin that we can speak, that I'm going to be talking about here, is going to be that, you know, that the relation between the Father and the Son is that the Son has his origin in the Father, the Holy Spirit has his origin in the Father and the Son, right? And the Father has no origin, he is unoriginate. And so the, these are... The divine persons and how we can distinguish between between them so uh, this is established by uh, scriptural passages where it is said that uh, the holy spirit is the spirit of christ galatians 4 6 romans you know john 16 14 these are just some of the few verses there's there are some, there are you know quite a lot of verses that in scripture where, where the holy spirit is said to be the spirit of christ so um the response here is that St. Photius responds to this argument, actually. Um, St. Photius says that the scriptures also said that the spirit is the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of love. So does that mean that the Holy Spirit proceeds from love? From love? Does it mean that the Sp Holy Spirit proceeds from wisdom, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from understanding? <laughs> right? I mean, by that logic, you'd have to also say that. You'd have to also admit that. So you are... If you want to take this to its logical conclusion, then really you're just establishing relations of origins, more relations of origins with the Holy Spirit uh, on a scriptural basis. But if you say, no, these are, this is a kind of a different, the, the off is a different stance, then you're also admitting that when, when scripture says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, well, that can be the Spirit of Christ in a different sense. So, for example... Though this is an argument used by Theodoret, and, and you know, this is mostly an historian argument. I'm not saying this is a valid argument. I'm just saying that, you know, if someone hypothetically said that it says the Spirit of Christ because it is referring to the Holy Spirit resting in Christ's human nature, right? That's a, I mean, that's not even like a specifically an historian argument, but historians use this argument a lot. They kind of had that view. So, is that not a possible interpretation of that verse, right? Uh, yes, it will be. So, of can be, can mean many things. It does not have to mean from. But the Roman, what is the Roman Catholic presupposition? Of is identical with from. True is identical with from also, right? These are the presuppositions behind the readings of this te of these texts. Uh, another point that I want to use to kind of disprove this argument is going to be from St. John of Damascus. <clears throat> now, let me see where I can find him. I, I think I have a tweet about this. Uh, let's see. Nope, not here. 
But the argument is from St. John of Damascus's, uh, yeah, it's from St. John of Damascus's Fount of Knowledge. And let me see, let me get the image open. All right. There we go. So this is from this, this page is from uh, Dr. David Bradshaw's Aristotle East and West. Um, he is quoting St. John Damascus's Fount of Knowledge here. Uh, St. John says, we do not speak of the spirit as from the sun. So already he refused the Roman Catholic presupposition. I mean, it's a bad day for you guys. Uh, but yet we call him the spirit of the sun. So he says, he's spirit from the sun, but he's not the spirit from the sun, but he's spirit of the sun. And we confess that he is manifested and imparted to us through the sun. For he breathed, it says, and he said to his disciples, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. It is just the same as in the case of the sun, from which come both the ray and the radiance. For the sun itself is the source of both the ray and the radiance. Do you see this? Do you see what St. John is saying here? For the sun itself is the source of both the ray and the radiance. It is through the ray that the radiance is imparted to us. So radiance is not caused by the ray, but the ray imparts the radiance to us, the heat that is, right? So for example, again, the heat of the sun, uh, the rays of the sun, they, they proceed from the sun itself and they are sent to us, right? You see the light of the sun, etc. But the heat is transferred from the sun through the rays of the sun where we participate in the sun's heat. That's basically the analogy St. John is using here. Notice again, the sun itself is the source of both the ray and the radiance. It is true, their ray, that the radiance is imparted to us. And it is, now some people might, some science heads might say, well, actually, technically speaking, light causes heat. So, uh, filioquis proves filioquis. But you need to understand that um, St. John is not operating with that kind of an understanding of science, right? Um, so we need to understand the science of his, of his time, the scientific understanding. And by the way, I mean, technically speaking, in a greater sense, um, that's not really that super correct either, right? But anyways, you know, you, you got to have that in mind. So Dr. Bradshaw points out, both the ray and the radiance derive their being from the sun, yet it is only the radiance in which we directly participate, while the ray is that which imparts the radiance and makes it known. John uses this analogy to support his point that the sun eternally manifests and imparts the spirit, yet the spirit derives his being only from the Father. Uh, to support this statement, I'm going to be uh, also quoting St. Gregor of Nyssa's great catechism. Uh, he says, We regard it, that is the Holy Spirit, as that which accompanies the word and manifests his energy, and not as a mere effluence of the breath. So what is, again, St. Gregor of Nyssa here is saying that the Holy Spirit impart, you know, the, imparts the divine energies to us, or, you know, eternally, and manifest this energy eternally through the sun. So, this pretty much showcases that both in St. John of Damascus and in St. Gregory of Nyssa, uh, there is a kind of a relation between the sun and the Holy Spirit that is not a relation of origin. That's the main point here, right? So the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, but not from Christ. This is because the Holy Spirit proceeds through the sun, like the radiance of the sun proceeding through the rays of the sun. But the radiance of the sun does not derive its existence from the rays. It derives it from the sun. Likewise, the Spirit proceeds from the Father, but eternally and in creation proceeds through the sun. And, you know, so, you know, remember again, St. Gregory of Nyssa's uh, great catechism. Uh, we regard it, you know, the, his statement in his uh, catechism we regard the Holy Spirit as that which accompanies the word and manifests his energy and not as a mere influence of the breath. This showcases that for St. Gregory, the relation between the Son and the Spirit is not by origin alone, but the mode in which they act eternally and the mode in which they act with relation to creation. So that's pretty much how we will refute that first argument. So moving on. So, the, so this is again the Roman Catholic Right. So how do we understand John 15, 26 and certain statements by the fathers that say the spirit proceeds from the father? It does not say the spirit proceeds from the father alone. 
Whereas with the Son, he is called the only begotten of the Father. So since the Spirit does not proceed from the Father alone, we can understand that the procession from the Father includes the Son too. This is why the Greek fathers are harmonized with the Filioque, since they say that the Spirit proceeds through the Son. They are simply saying what the Latins say, that the Son being cause-cause of the Holy Spirit had the Spirit proceed through him. St. Kirill, for instance, says the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, the Father, as well as of the Son, and comes forth substantially from both, that is, from the Father through the Son. And St. Maximus confirms in his letter to Marinus that the Latins, in preaching that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, are not wrong, but in fact are justified due to documentary evidence from Latin fathers and even St. Kirill of Alexandria himself. This is why the Filioque is not an addition to the Creed, but a clarification of it, since the Creed is concerned with the Father as a principal cause of procession. It clarifies that the Son also partakes of this procession of the Holy Spirit eternally, not as uncaused cause, but as caused cause. Statements from fathers like St. Gregory Theologian where he says that the Son has everything from the Father except for causality then is understood as the Son not being uncaused cause, but causality here means that uh, specifically that you know the Father being uncaused cause. Being uncaused is untransferable, but being caused is transferable, so the Son is still a cause cause. And so causality in the Greek farce can be gen generically couched as being uncaused cause. Once that's understood, St. Gregory, can, we can say here, uh, St. Gregory Theologian is not rejecting the Filioque, but rather is understood to say that the Son is, you know, uh, is a cause from the Father. But since the Son has all that the Father has, he also has the Father's ability to cause the Holy Spirit, which is why the Spirit proceeds from both, even though the po power is the Father. So there's one principle of, you know, the, of procession, right? There's no, not two sources or two causes. There's one cause, the Father and the Son together. That's pretty much kind of the whole, the, the point. So the response to this, is, I will start my response by just saying what the St. Gregory Theologian statement is in question, which is from Oration 34, where he says, everything the Father has belongs to the Son with the exception of causality. So if causality is referring not to fatherhood, you know, or fatherhood or causing a divine person, but specifically being uncaused cause, right? So again, causality in the Greek sense, this argument in a different way, we can we can couch it, is causality in the Greek sense means being uncaused and being a cause while being uncaused. And perhaps I will I will I suppose they will kind of you know use Aristotelianism to make that point because Aristotle kind of had that you know uh, metaphysic, right? But the problem with this kind of argument, we're like, oh well, anytime the Greek fathers say that the father is the is the cause. We just say, we just understand it as being uncaused cause, not excluding that the sun is also caused. I mean, you can already see that this argument is a little copish, but the real problem with this argument is that this will actually totally refute Roman Catholicism. Uh, why will it refute Roman Catholicism? Well, if you look at the definition of the Council of Florence, which I've, I've showed this definition numerous times, Numerous, numerous, but this is a dog, dogmatic definition from the Council of Florence. So, this is from the sixth session. Read very carefully, especially this part. Acor the sun, according to the Greeks, so according to the Greeks, you know, these guys think, not Florence, but like some of these people making arguments, or the Filioque, when they read these, you know, statements from the fathers, you know, uh, the Greek sense of the word cause, it has to mean uncaused cause. And then Florence says, yeah, the sun is cause in the Greek sense. So if that's how you're going to couch it, then doesn't that mean that Florence is saying that the sun is uncaused? If you're going to say, no, uh, there's a different Greek sense of the word cause. Well, then... <laughs> Your argument doesn't make any sense. You're basically saying, oh, these statements that seemingly refute my theology, um, like, just to, because I am correct, that you, this is basically what you're saying. Because I'm correct, because I'm correct, it just has to mean a different thing. <laughs> it's, 
And this is kind of the, the Gnostic technique of redefining already established words to kind of fit the new paradigm that you're trying to create, right? It's the same kind of Gnostic argumentation. Um, I pointed this out in my video on Gnosticism. Uh, when I talk about Gnosticism, if you, if you search Gnostic or Gnosticism on my YouTube search, you'll find a video that I'm referring to. But um, it's, a, it's the second video in history of Christian theology. So check that playlist if you haven't already. The, my magnum opus. Um, but if that's kind of how you're going to play this game, then you're going to run into a problem like this, right? Um, secondly, I will say that I believe, uh, uh where can I find this passage? Hmm. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't make this a note here. Yeah. Um, St. John of Damascus in his found of knowledge actually connects causality and fatherhood to each other. Uh, so let me, let me get the, yeah, it's, and it's actually, you know, the, the quote is from the, you know, it's, you know, you can see that the same quote is, is also here, right? We can also confess that he, that uh, he was manifest and communicated, right? I already read this part, but what he says above is he says, one should know that we do not say that the father is of anyone, but that we do say that he is the father of the son. We do not say that the son is a cause or a father. Cause or a father, right? So being father, you know, being on cause doesn't mean, you know, that you're a father, right? So fatherhood, right, is by begetting a son. So St. John is pretty much saying that causality, if you have the power of causality, then you in your hypostasis, you as a person have that personal power to cause. That is, you had a personal power of being father. But we do say that he is from the father and is the son of the father. And we do say that the Holy Ghost is of the father and we call him the spirit of the father. Neither do we say that the spirit is from the son. So again, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit from the Father, but it's not the Spirit from the Son. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't see how this kind of redefinition of these terms is actually going to help you out. It's it's not right. It doesn't help you out. Um, in fact, it just it's just mental gymnastics, right? And I want to be, you know, I'm I'm in fact going to be kind of a little annoying here, and say, well. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I could just invoke Occam's razor. You're just in your explanation of how the, how these statements from the fathers make sense. You're just adding more parameters, more arbitrary parameters. Well, I don't have to accept those arbitrary parameters. And, you know, unless there's like an actual really good case that in the Greek patristic tradition, cause means being on cause in the Trinity, this is a very difficult argument. This is a very difficult argument to maintain. And so far, I haven't seen that, right? So far, I haven't seen that, right? And I'm talking about in a very general sense. It's will be, it will be very difficult to prove that, I suppose, but that doesn't really exist. And this is just me being very charitable. I can just say the text says cause, <laughs> The text says cause, dude. It doesn't say uncaused cause. Anyways, uh, Another another point is about like again, so part of this argument is you know, part of the argument that is being made is that well it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone. So the the problem with this argument is that even if you show them statements like that, that still won't refute this argument. This argument is kind of just is a fallacious argument. And I want to show you, I want to give you an example of why. Um, <clears throat> let's say, for example, I found a, I found a saint, found a church father saying, or let's say that there was a statement in the Bible that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father alone and not from the Son, right? Here's what these Roman Catholics will say. Oh, he is saying what that means is that, you know, the Father is the principal cause but the son is not the principal cause, but gets the principal cause from the father, right? So even though it says alone, it means that he is the principal cause of the uh, uh, of the spirit alone, 
But when we talk about, you know, the being car cars, that's not what's being, you know, talked about. That, that's what they will say, right? So the kind of like argument of like, oh, the, the Greeks, they always insert alone, but it doesn't necessarily mean alone. Even if it's wrote alone in giant letters, you will still be making these arguments, right? That's kind of the, that's kind of the thing. That's kind of the problem here. Uh, if you if you have witnessed the Perry Robinson Anthony Rogers debacle, there's a great example of it. And many fathers use the term sola fide. Even Pelagius uses the term sola fide that we are justified by faith alone. But what is the content of faith, right? If he said that we are justified by faith alone, and this is faith energized by love, and that faith without works is dead, the Protestant will say, well, that's not faith alone. That's not faith alone. You that's faith and works. Right? You're inserting works into faith. That's works salvation. In fact, they will say that's the opposite of faith alone. But I'm still saying, you know, it's faith, right? It's faith energized by works, but it's still faith alone, right? But to the Protestant, that's heretical, right? That's that's works salvation. Um, that is rejecting the gospel, right? That's what the Protestant will say. So the the the, the term alone does not establish really anything. Neither does the absence of the term alone establish anything. So arguing from the absence of evidence of the term alone doesn't really help you. Doesn't really help you out, right? And faith energized by love, that put, that's the point I'm making by essence and just distinction in, in the Bible. Uh, the, this, this verse is in Galatians 5, 6. All right, love is a work. Faith is energized by love. Um, so again, you could, I hope you can kind of understand the argument that I make here is that they will still be making the same arguments, right? Because they're just adding just further and further and further classifications to how we are supposedly able to read the fathers, right? And it just turns from reading the fathers and learning from them into just trying to make a conceptual scheme that we're like you're trying your absolute best to like make it fit make the fathers and scripture fit into that but that's not really how it properly works that's not really how you're supposed to defend the faith right that is just your own gospel you're just creating your own gospel and you're trying to defend your own gospel uh <clears throat> another point is from yeah the point about saint Kirill, right uh saint Kirill supposedly defending the filioque Tyshinsky notes because he he actually uses that quote from Saint Kirill where he speaks of the Holy Spirit substantially proceeding from both. He says, "Yet in none of the passages or anywhere in his writings does Kirill say that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son." So the Greek term here for proceed is ekporusti. Rather, he con consistently maintains that the Spirit progresses or flows forth, that is proine or progesti. From the sun, which is something rather different. So what is the difference here? The difference between ekprovumenon and proine is mostly a patristic distinction in the modes of the procession of the Holy Spirit. So ekprovumenon generally means generation. And I say generally because technically speaking, proine and ekprovumenon, they're actually synonyms, right? So they can also be used interchangeably. But pro, uh, ex provumenon generally means uh, generation. In fact, it is used for the Son too. So St. Kirill of Alexandria uh, says that the, whole, that the Son proceeds from the Father. Does that mean that he believes that um, begetting and procession are the same thing? Well, actually, if you're Roman Catholic, due to relations of origin, that's kind of, you kind of believe that. But the fact that many of the fathers, in fact, speak of the distinction between procession and begetting means that there is a difference between the two that is outside of the, the, the number of origins, right? So uh, what St. Kirill is pretty much saying here is really no different from what St. Gregory of Nyssa is saying and what St. John of Damascus is saying, which is that although the Holy Spirit is caused by the Father alone, uh, he progress. He flows from the Father through the Son in energetic activities, whether those activities are temporal in creation or whether those activities are eternal, right? Uh, 
So there's always an eternal relation between the Son and the Holy Spirit, but this relation is based on the mode in which they act, right? So in the hypostatic modes of being. So the Greek patristic tradition then makes a distinction between the Spirit's existence procession from the Father and the Spirit's progression from the Father through the Son, which is about divine energies. The previous quotes from St. John Damascus and St. Kirill of Nyssa further amplifies the point that St. Kirill is not saying the Holy Spirit derives his being from the Son, rather that the, that the Son sends the Holy Spirit to creation or that the Spirit rests in the Son as he carries in his person the divine energy, whatever that divine energy is, is whether it's wisdom, understanding, um, salvific grace, you know, that's what, these are the energies that the Holy Spirit carries in his person. Uh, and this is why St. Paul says that it is the same spirit that energizes all in all, right? It's the, it's the same spirit that dispenses these divine energies. Uh, let me, in fact, talk about, you know, which quote is this? This is um, 1 Corinthians 12, 6. And there are diversities of energies, but it is the same God which energizes all in all. And then he, in a couple of verses later, goes on to say, uh, as I <laughs> as I search again, because I have it off of memory, but I want to get the exact the exact statement. Uh, yes, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For the one is given by the Spirit of the Word of Wisdom, to another the Word of Knowledge by the same Spirit. Right. So these are the energies of the Holy Spirit: the Spirit of Wisdom, the Spirit of Knowledge. Um, really knowledge, wisdom, these are energies uh, that the Holy Spirit dispenses to us. It gives to us. Uh, oh, there are dogs outside barking, but it's, it is quite late. I don't think you can hear that, though. But I can hear it, but I don't think you can hear it, so that's fine. Uh, so, the kind of the main point that I'm trying to get at here is that if you have a belief... If you believe that God has divine energies and his divine energies distinct from his divine essence, then you can establish different kinds of relations in the Trinity. It does not just have to be relations of origin, right? That is pretty much what we're kind of getting at here. To, to further the point about St. Kirill, uh, Theodoret's Epistle 171 uh, says that St. Kirill rejects the idea that the Holy Spirit is not of the Son, nor derives existence from the Son. So uh, this was a dispute between Theodore and St. Kirill of Alexandria, uh, where St. Kirill of Alexandria pretty much said, no, I do not believe that the Holy Spirit gets his existence from the Son, right? Uh, you know, St. Mark of Ephesus notes this in the Council of Florence. I've had, I have numerous videos talking about this exact point ad nauseum. So I'm just going to be reading out the part from Shesensky's book on the Fulioque, where he says, Kirill, in his ninth anatoma against Nestorius, had stated that the Spirit was Christ's own Spirit, which led Theodoret to question whether Kirill was advocating the idea that the Spirit has a subsistence from the Son or through the Son. For Theodoret, this idea was both blasphemous and impious, for we believe the Lord who has said, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. Kirill denied that he held this teaching, leading Theodoret to confirm the orthodoxy of Kirill's Trinitarian theology, since the Church had always taught that the Holy Spirit does not receive existence from or through the Son, but proceeds from the Father and is called the proprium of the Son because of his consubstantiality. Um, and another letter that I want to talk about is St. Maximus's letter to Marinus, which again, uh, you know, the, the, the hypothetical Roman Catholic mentioned this, but... <clears throat> uh, right, so this statement here, focus on here. Again, you know, look... At, the Holy Spirit proceeds also from the Son. What does he say about it? He says that the Latins know, in fact, that the Father is the only cause of the Son and the Spirit, the one by begetting and the other by procession. So begetting and procession are not distinguished by how many relations there are, but they are distinct in and of themselves. Now, what exactly is the character of this distinction? We do not know, as St. Gregory the Theologian says. We do not know the matter of this distinction, but we know from Revelation that they are distinct. What is an example of this? 
Well, the human family is a great example, says St. Gregory the Theologian. He says that uh, just like Adam is unbegotten, so is the father unbegotten. Just like Eve proceeds from Adam's rib, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the father. And just like Seth is begotten from Adam, the son is begotten from the father. Right? And so the Holy Spirit is not caused by the father, but this expression of double procession from the Latins is used to ma to manifest the Spirit's coming forth that is pro ine, through him, and in this way to make clear the unity and identity of essence. I know that this blog actually argues that this proves the filioque way, but it in fact proves the absolute opposite. Proves the absolute opposite um, because St. Maximus explicitly says that the Son does not cause the Holy Spirit. And this also contradicts the Council of Florence, which says that the Holy Spirit is caused by the Son in the Greek sense of the word cause. Right? <clears throat> so let me read through my notes again. I, I've been sick for like a couple days again. This was a very minor sickness because I was out in the wild, you know, out in the village, saving the world. So I got a little, I, I got a little cold, but I'm good now, right? Uh, so I know it's just a tiny a little bit blocked. Uh, and I want to see if I, I don't think, I think that's all of the notes, all of the points that I wanted to make. All right. So now let's continue with the Roman Catholics. So again, anything that I'm saying until I stop, it's the Roman Catholic arguing, right? The principle of this procession is God's nature according to and and according to Ludwig Ott, the Holy Ghost proceeds from the will or the mutual love of the Father and the Son. So that we understand then that the Holy Spirit is willed, that is love of the Father and the Son, and is their common bond. This further strengthens the idea of Trinitarian relations by relations of origin. However, some argue that this means that the Spirit is a product of God's will. That is not the case. This is simply a description of the Spirit's uh, mode of existence. Since persons are relations, the relation of the Spirit and the love between the Father and the Son is love. The Spirit is then, so to speak, love from love. So the Spirit is not a result of God's ad extra will, that is the will that, is, that caused this creation, but ad intra will, that is the divine essence of the Father and the Son which generates the Holy Spirit. So then, how do we answer some of the other potential objections from the Orthodox? For example, they believe in, they argue from the hypostatic properties that, you know, the Father is uh, unbegotten, the Son is begotten, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. These are the hypostatic properties. But the Latin Fathers also speaks about hypostatic properties. For example, St. Fulgentius of Ruspe, uh, who says the hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit is to proceed from the Father and the Son. And he is an Orthodox saint too. So they say that since the property of the Father is to be caused, the Son cannot cause the Spirit. If that is the case, St. Photius says that this is semi sibelianism But this is not the case because we distinguish the persons based off of their relation of origin. And so since the, the Son has one origin and the Holy Spirit has, one or, has two origins, um, this accusation does not make sense. We can still distinguish between each of the divine persons. There is no Sibelianism going on around here. So um, there's actually a lot of point by point things that I want to go point by point. So I want to talk about uh, the, the quote from Ludwig God. The Holy Ghost proceeds from the will or the mutual law of the Father and the Son, right? So this is kind of, you know, if, you, if you read J. Dyer's argument on the filioque as the Aryan subordination of the Holy Spirit, um, he, his, his thesis is basically, uh, since Roman Catholic dogma says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the will uh, of God, the Holy Spirit therefore must be a product of God's will. The response um, generally is that there is a distinction between ad intra will and ad extra will, right? Uh, and this argument is also similar to the argument I used uh, about uh, the, the St. Athanasius quote about uh, uh, from his third discourse against the Arians, he says, A man by counsel builds a house, but by nature he begets a son. And what is in building be began to come into being at will and is external to the maker. So what is the, the, the product of the divine will is external to God. Uh, but the son is proper offspring of the father's essence and is not external to him. 
Therefore, neither does he. So, you know, it's not external to him. So the, the son is not a product of God's will. Therefore, uh, St. Athanasius continues, uh, neither does he counsel concerning him, lest he appear to counsel about himself. As far then as the son transcends the creature, by so much does what is by nature transcend the will. And they, on hearing of him, ought not to measure by will what is by nature. So St. Athanasius is basically saying here that the son is a product of God's nature. Right? So he's a generation of God's uh, nature. So uh, the, the, the way they read this is pretty much that add the add extra will is what creates things. So that is what St. Athanasius means by will. But the add intra will is what St. Athanasius means by generation by nature. That's how the Roman Catholic view of the statement from St. Athanasius' third discourse is understood. Um, there, are, there are obviously problems with this. So the, the first thing I will say is that Ott also says the object of the divine will by which the Father and Son produce the Holy Spirit is primarily that which God necessarily loves, namely the divine essence. So the divine essence is the object of the divine will, which is the same thing that produces the Holy Spirit, and secondarily that which he freely loves, which, which are created things. But didn't we share a quote from Thomas Aquinas' Summa Contra Gentilis? Yes, we did. What is that quote? Let me remind you. If then God shall principally will something other than himself, it will follow that something other is the cause of his willing, but his willing is his being. From this, it further appears that the principal object of the divine will is the divine essence. Right. That's why Ott says that the secondary object of the divine will is is, is creation, but then he says, Moreover, since every agent acts so far as it is an act, God, who is pure act, must act through his essence. Willing, however, is a certain operation of God. Therefore, God must be endowed with will through his essence. Therefore, his will is his essence. From this, it appears that God's will is not other than the essence. So, what does it mean here? This means that the will of God, which creates... And the nature of God, which generates, are the same. St. of Alexandria, the, the best way we can understand what St. Athanasius say is not by looking at what the Roman Catholics say about it. It's what by, by looking at what people who succeed him say. So, for example, what does St. Carol of Alexandria, who speaks about, who in his anti-Aryan apologetics, what does he say about this, right? Is there something similar that he says concerning this topic. Yes, there is. And I want to show you my... Um, I, can, I can read it to you, but I can... Let me, let me actually just read it to you. In his Thesaurus, I believe, 18... Oh, actually, why not? There's a Perry's blog, Energetic Procession, that actually uses this quote. Uh, let me see. Where is this? Thesaurus 18, Petrologia Graeca 75. Um, oh, but it's 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 a really shortened version. I'm gonna read the I'm gonna read the longer version of it. Saint of Alexandria says the work of energy of God is to create, while that of nature is to give birth. Therefore, nature and energy in God are not identical. So, what is what is energy? Well, energy is the movement of the divine will. So, and what does St. Kirill say about essence and energy? He says that God's essence generates. God's essence generates things. God's will or God's energy creates things. This is why God's essence and energy is not identical. But again, what was energy? The movement of the will. So, St. Kirill is also therefore saying God's will and his essence are also not identical. So that's how we understand St. Athanasius' statement. St. Kirill commentates on St. Athanasius' distinction between creation and generation. The Arian position, for instance, was that creation and generation are the same. And this is based off of origins, uh, confusion of the two concepts, which is really, you know, further back it goes to the, the Hellenic idea, right? That creation is eternal, it's a generation of God. And um, and so 
the Arian apologetic is that since God's will is his essence, and since you know they, they had the same exact uh, simplicity view as Roman Catholics have on this topic, they also say this say the pretty very much same thing. Their argument then is therefore, well, the sun is a product of God's will, right? Since cre creation is generated and the sun is generated, this therefore means that the sun is a creature. And so the father, right? God, God's essential characteristic is then unbegotten, right? Being begotten means being generated and the sun being generated cannot be unbegotten, cannot be ingenerate. Therefore, the sun has to be a creature. Um, this is, again, fundamentally due to the confusion of God's essence and his will. And St. Athanasius, in making this distinction, argues that whatever is the work of God's essence generates a divine person. Whatever is a work of God's will, or St. Kirill of Alexandria says, whatever is a work of God's energy, that's what creates things. So this is how we can distinguish between creation and generation. So the distinction between essence and energy, or essence and will, or both, is fundamental to the anti-Aryan apologetic. But what does Thomas Aquinas say? Thomas Aquinas says they're the same thing. And then the Roman Catholics say added the, that there's a distinction between ad intra will and ad extra will. Ad extra will creates things. Ad intra will generates things. Well, let me ask you a question then. Is ad extra will the same as ad intra will? If it's the same, that ad extra will is also uncreated, it is the same as ad intra will, and it is the same thing that generates. So there is a confusion between generation and creation, the Aryan position. So it has to be created, right? God's ad extra will creates. But wait a second, that's literally the Aryan position too. <laughs> it's just Arianism applied not to the sun, but to something different, right? So it's basically Neoplatonist the theology. Why am I saying this? Because uh, it's not, it, because in this scheme, what, what is the biblical scheme? The biblical scheme is that all things are created through the sun, right? Well, the sun is uncreated. So since th all things are created through the sun, the, the sun is kind of the medium between the uncreate you know uncreation and creation that's literally what saint paul says in first timothy 2 5. that's that's a christological statement but there's also a statement about the mode of the sun's existence right all things are done through the sun and without him was nothing made but if creation is made through a medium of an ad extra will whatever that means then or whatever else you want to talk about if there's a created medium in order to create things well first of all if all things are created through a created medium, what created the created medium? <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So it leads to modal collapse, right? There is a modal collapse on this very question. This distinction is an invalid kind of a distinction. It leads to, to massive problems. And this distinction is there to protect the filioque. That is the problem. So, uh, Thomas Aquinas, again, also says that the object of the divine will is identical to the divi divine will uh, in chapters 73 and 74 in Summa Contra Gentilis. Um, yes, so the argument, the Arian accusation of the filioque actually still stands, right? Um, if the Holy Spirit is a product of the ad intra will of God, then, yeah, okay, that's it. He's generated from the divine essence, right? Uh, <clears throat> but the ad intra will also creates things, right? <laughs> uh, even though the you know it's it's ad extra will, but the ad intra will is the vehicle. You know, there's that kind of relationship, but it's again the creative medium relationship there. Um, so either the Arianism is applied to the Holy Spirit, or it's applied to the Son again, right? That's pretty much kind of the argument, the, the advanced, developed version of the argument, you can say. Uh, so this argument, this kind of like distinction is kind of just a, it's it's pretty much trying to explain things from St. Athanasius, but, you know, all of these things, they're just creating 
problems that didn't exist and won't exist if you just admit it that there is a real distinction between God's essence, energy, hypostasis, and will. If you admitted these distinctions, which is fundamental in St. Maximus the Confessor's argument against, mo against monotolite, because another aspect of the uh, modal collapse argument that I want to point out is the presupposition that uh, everything that is natural is compelled. What is natural is compelled. Um, this is a presupposition of the monotolites, where St. Maximus in his disputation against Pyrrhus talked about this. So St. Maximus, uh, for example, points out that, you know, Pyrrhus, sorry, points out that what is natural is compelled. And St. Maximus uh, says, if what is natural is compelled, then, you know, God is creator by nature. Does that mean that God is compelled to be a cre creator? Right, so let me... Um, okay, this petition, this petition with Pyrrhus, uh, you can read the translation, but this is also in Petrologia, Great Canine 1, but there's an English translation of it you, you can read. Uh, he says, if one were to continue in this line of reasoning that what is natural is compelled, then God, who is by nature God and by nature creator, must of necessity be not only God, but also creator. creator. To think much less to speak in this manner is the height of blasphemy, for who attributes necessity to God? But if God is, for example, creator by nature, and if the will is identical to God's essence or nature, then God also is compelled to be creator. If God is compelled to be creator, then God did not create out of his free choice. Then God does not have free choice. Then the ad intra will really is not even a will. Then God lacks a will. And since God lacks a will, as St. Maximus says, you know, God will be lacking in energy. But if God lacks energy, then God lacks existence. Therefore, God doesn't exist. <laughs> it's uh, the, the progression is quite funny, but it actually does lead to that conclusion. As, uh, as you know, some people might not like that, but that is the conclusion that it leads to, right? Uh, and again, what is the source of this? Filioque is part of it. Why, is the fili why does the filioque exist? In order to establish some kind of plurality or distinction in God where there is no real distinction. Now again, when I say real distinction, I'm not speaking of a real distinction in the in a very detailed, strict, metaphysical, Thomistic sense. I am speaking of a I'm speaking of a metaphysical I'm I'm basically saying, you know. The divine essence, let's say the divine essence is X and the divine will is Y. They're not the same thing, right? Now, in a sense, you can say there's a relation, there's a, you know, you can, in a, in a sense, you can say that they're like these, for example, you can say that I am identical to human nature, right? Because I am a man. Human nature, you know, the universal human nature subsists in my person. So, technically speaking, I am man. I am a man, right? I am an example of human nature, right? So I am identical to my human nature. You can say that in a sense where you still then afterwards say, but at the same time, there is a distinction. For example, a, the universal human nature is not a YouTuber, but I am, right? So there are certain particular characteristics that I have, right? So Nature is what hypostasis share in common, right? So, uh, you and I, what do we share in common? Well, we're both human beings. That's what we share in common. So, that is the commonality between our persons. And this is why, again, 1 Timothy 2.5, which is one of my favorite verses, my favorite and my least favorite verses because of the, how it's, like abused by Protestants, but 1 Timothy 2, 5, again, the son is the mediator between God and man because the son in his hypostasis has the commonality with God because he is of the same essence with the father, but also has commonality with us because he is man. And so in his person, men and God are reconciled in the crucifixion. Men and God become reconciled in the person of Jesus Christ. That's why this is important. Uh, so that's why these distinctions between these these terms, etc., they're very important, right? 
So the the Athanasian apologetic is that uh, God is generating a son, but he freely chooses to create things. So one of the things that uh, St. Gregory Theologian, you know, was asked, for example, is the is the son voluntarily produced, right? Like, is the son voluntarily generated? Right? So this is kind of the thing, the distinction is that they will make, well, God freely chooses to create. So the Roman Catholic here will say, Roman Catholic, you know, he freely chooses to create, but uh, the thing is that, you know, he, he, his, he generates a son by his concomitant will. So, you know, it's, it's not a production of his divine will, but, you know, the, his will basically is okay with it. So basically kind of that point, which technically isn't really incorrect, but the, the main power behind, the, behind responding to the argument, well, is the son a voluntary, you know, generation of the father, is, is the question of, well, what is the father? Right? Who is the father, rather? Being father, that is, causing a son, is an essential characteristic to the father's person. It is essential to who he is. It is necessarily true and essential to who the person of the father is. It's who he is, right? It, this is like asking if God willed to be unoriginate did god will to exist no existence right is what god is right that answers the question of what god is it is his very being to exist it is his very being to be good and like that it is the very being of the father to be the father of the son this is why the name father describes the relation between the father and the son. But notice, St. Gregory the Theologian does not say that the person of the father is identical to the relation. He doesn't say persons are relations. He says the name describes a relation, but it doesn't mean that they're merely reduced to being a relation. Right? So, uh, this is why the question of generation cannot be a question of will, because it is the very personal characteristic of the father to be the father. Um, I, I responded to the St. Kirill point. Uh, St. Kirill is simply elaborating and developing St. Athanasius' distinction between creation and generation contra Arianism. The work of God's energy creates, the work of God's nature generates. If God's ad extra will is uncreated, then it really is just the same thing as his ad interval, which confuses generation and creation. If the ad extra will is created, and it is true the ad extra will that the world is created, etc., then that's just Arianism applied not to the Son, but to God's free choice, which brings on modal collapse. God either does not have free choice or creation is the same as generation. And Arius, in this scheme, was right, if that's the argument, right? So those are the two horns. On the point of semi-Sabellianism, I will, uh, so, you know, we're, now I'm responding to the argument that, well, there is no, there's no semi-Sabellianism if the sun is Kokos. Well, again, let's get back to the point of the essential fundamental characteristic of the person of the father, right? which is causing the sun. Um, the, the power to cause a divine person, it's either essential to the essence, which means that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit will have this, or it is essential to hypostasis, right? It's based on the hypostasis. It is a hypostatic property. Well, no one's going to deny that the Eastern Fathers, at the very least, say that Causality is a hypostatic property of the father, right? That, that this is a hypostatic property. If the so the basis of causality is something that the father uniquely shares, not not share, that the father uniquely possesses in his person. It is therefore not an essential characteristic of God. It is an essential characteristic to the person of the father. When I say essential characteristic, I don't mean in the sense that the father is a different essence than the son. Right? Because causality, you know, it answers the question of how something exists, not what that thing that exists is. So, for example, how a tree is caused does not answer the question of what that is, right? You already have established that that is a tree, right? So, for example, a tree can be planted or, you, you know, a tree can uh, grow naturally. That Those are two different ways a tree can be caused, but neither of these two things can establish the fact that, you know, 
they don't they don't describe the nature of the tree right and this is something that i've talked about in previous videos all the time as well i don't think this is a difficult point but the point that i'm trying to get at is since causality is a unique property of the father's hypostasis and it is you know it's an it's an aspect of the father's person if that was shared with the son then that means that the father shares his hypostasis with the son now remember the common commonality that hypostasis have is you know if there's a commonality between hypostasis that's what nature is right so either the commonality that the father and the son have is a natural commonality that is of the same nature or it's the commonality of hypostasis right so for example two different natures can unite and have a commonality of hypostasis i think Colonel alexander used the example of um fire you know uh iron that is burning right fire uh that is burning on iron you know when you you know smack the, the iron with a hammer the the hammer doesn't hit the fire but it hits the iron right but there's still two natures but fire is subsisting in that example of it iron right so they the they together these two natures in that scenario share the same existence or same hypostasis so it's it, the commonality is either the nature or it's the hypostasis well if the commonality is the hypostasis first then you know that's semi sabellianism there's a confusion of the hypostasis but it also means that there's a difference of natures either between the father and the son or between the father and the son and the holy spirit right so to kind of dial back because maybe you don't understand what i'm trying to get at is that hypostatic properties are non-transferable right if causality is transferred to the son from the father then that either confuses that either in some sense mixes the hypostasis of the father and the son which means god becomes composite which means that god doesn't exist that this is not the true idea of god right so you can't have that um but if God gives an aspect of his hypostasis to the son, that's what happens, right? That's why it's called semi sabellianism That's why they, the St. Fodius says it's semi sabellianism There's a reason he doesn't say it's sabellianism There's a reason why he says it's semi sabellianism It's because, you know, there's still some kind of a distinction, but now there's a mixture between two hypostases. The other alternative, again, is that, you know, this, this power of causality, that's from nature. Well, if, if that's from nature... That the Holy Spirit is of a different nature. So Arianism, right? Or maybe the Father and the Son are of different natures. Which, you know, <laughs> Arianism, not normal Arianism, or you know, uh Arianism applied to the Holy Spirit, right? Pick your poison. That's basically the options that you have if you have this kind of a kind of an idea. So you might say, Well, David, I think hypostatic properties are transferable. Well, St. Gregory of Nyssa says the characteristic of the father's person cannot be transferred to the son or, the, or to the spirit, nor, on the other hand, can that of the son be accommodated to one of the others, or the property of the spirit be attributed to the father and the son. Now, you, this is in Johannes, this is quoted in Johannes Quasten's Patrologia Tree, page 267. Right, since, so if they could be attributed to other persons, that will mean that part of the hypostasis will be attributed to other hypostasis, which is nonsensical. This is the this is the strength of Saint Photius's argument. Uh, Saint John of Damascus also says this. Um, being begun for the Father is caused. Yeah. Uh, so Saint John of Damascus also says something. I, I will say very similar to this. Um, right. The Father is uncaused and unbegotten because he is not from anything, but has his being from himself and does not have from any other in from any other anything whatsoever that he has rather he himself is the principle and cause by which all things naturally exist as it no it's the principle and cause not principle or cause by which all things naturally exist as they do and the son is begotten of the father while the holy ghost is himself also of the father although not by begetting but by procession now we have learned that there is a difference between begetting and procession but what the manner of this difference is we have not learned at all so if saint john damascus believed in the fully create doesn't this mean that he'd know the difference between the two the difference between beginning and procession will be that begetting is from one source procession will be you know will be will you will have one origin procession will mean that you have two origins no yeah he doesn't say that right that's why this statement is actually fatal to filio creatum accordingly all things whatsoever the son has from the father the spirit also has including his very being 
And if the Father does not exist, then neither does the Son or the Spirit. And if the Father does not have something, then neither has the Son or the Spirit. Furthermore, because of the Father, that is, because of the fact that the Father is the Son, that, that, that the Father is, the Son and the Spirit are, and because of the Father, the Son and the Spirit have everything that they have, that is to say, because of the fact that the Father has them, ex excepting the being unbegotten, the begetting, and the procession. For it is only in these personal properties that the three divine persons differ from one another, being indivisibly divided by the distinctive note of each individual person. Right. So hypostatic properties cannot be transferable. Uh, and causality, which is a hypostatic power of the Father, cannot be transferred to the Son. And when I say causality, again, I'm, I'm talking about causing another divine person. Again, in, in, in another screenshot, I, I, I sh uh, you know, paid from St. John Damascus's uh, Found of Knowledge. He says that, you know, the, we, that we do not say that the son is a cause or a father. So, yeah, there you go. That's the, that's the argument of St. Photis, if you didn't understand, right? That's why St. Photis, again, criticizes the the Carolingian theology of the filio you know the Carolingian filioque uh, defenses and whatever uh, let's see again uh, if, if I mean if you don't understand this point fully then you can just ask me uh, in live chat or or as in a super chat um, all right now let's go back to the Roman Catholic arguments. Uh, the Orthodox also do not have any connection between the Son and the Spirit, since they reject the Filioque and claim only the Father causes the Son and the Spirit. How then is the Spirit the Spirit of Christ, as the Bible says? If there is a relation, then this relation is relation of origin, meaning that the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. The Orthodox cannot manage to have an eternal relationship between the Son and the Spirit, and for this reason, they do not, properly speaking, have a trinity. So, what is the relation between the Father and uh, the, between the Son and the Holy Spirit? Uh, the Holy Spirit and the Son have a relation with each other because, number one, they are in a communion of essence, as Theodoret and St. Kirill points out, and two, the mode in which they will and act are related and connected with each other. So, for example, the Son becomes baptized in his humanity, but the Spirit dispenses the divine grace to the Son's humanity. The Son sends the Spirit to creation, and the Spirit energizes all with its spirits of understanding the spirit of wisdom the spirit of prophecy which are the divine energies so the spirit energizes uh, you know the apostles for example whom the son sends the spirit to the son loves the father and the holy spirit manifests this love in his hypostasis between the father and the son so this is an eternal relation between father son holy spirit Thus, the only possible relation is not relation of origin, but relation of divine energies, which are determined by the hypostatic modes in which each of the divine persons in the Trinity act as one. So you don't need to have relations of origin to force a relation between the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's unnecessary. The Roman Catholic then says, The Roman Orthodox also say that the Father is the only principle in the Godhead. So, what is the principle of God's actions ad extra? Is it the Father or the divine nature? If it is the divine nature, then many persons can make up one principle, meaning that the Son can be a cause of the Holy Spirit as well. Uh, the answer to this, which is going to be a very bold answer, it's the Father. The Father is the principle of everything. St. John Damascus literally says that. The Father is the sole principle of everything. Um, for example, the divine nature is not some generic divine nature where it produces three persons. The divine nature is the nature of the Father. And everything that the Father has naturally, according to his nature, is given to the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's what, uh, you know, so that's how, you know, there are some things, some actions that can be a principle of divine nature. So, for example, the divine actions, right? Well, divine, you know, energy is, is a faculty of nature. So, um, when the sun incarnates or when, the, you know, when, uh, you know, God creates the world, it's a triune act. And so, this, it's a triune act because the basis of this unity is, well, primarily, again, it's the person of the Father, but also because they share the same essence, right? So, creating, the power to create the Father, Son, Holy Spirit can create because they have the same essence and creating is an essential power, right? But, so this is how, again, this is how there can be one principle, right? So the divine nature can be in this sense, 
one principle with many persons being that one principle. But again, some principles are natural where multiple persons can abide by and some principles are hypostatic. So the father is not only the monarch in the sense of being uncaused cause, he is the monarch of the Trinity in every single sense. In the sense of divine nature, in the sense... This is, for example, why Sigurd Theologian says, you know, the father is greater by cause. That's why the son says the father is greater than I, right? That's what that statement means. The father is greater than the sons in the, sen in the sense that that based off of that hypostatic relationship between the father and the son, the father causes the son. So in that sense, he is greater. But cause, that's not, you know, causing a divine person, that's not an essential characteristic, right? If it was essential, then, you know, the son will be essentially lesser than the father, meaning that the son will not be God. But the son is God. So it is based off of a hierarchical relationship, you can say, right? So, for example, human fathers are greater than their sons, but human fathers are also of the same essence as their son is. So, you know, in kind of like a metaphysical, like general value of all human beings, all human beings are valued the same. This is why St. Paul says there is neither Jew nor Greek, because we all share the same human nature that the son has incarnated in. <clears throat> and... So, the, the, you know, essential characteristic of the principle you know, can be the divine, but it's not, you know, it's not a, it can be both, you know. The Father is the very basis of everything about divinity, right? It's His divinity. It's His will, right? What does Scripture call the divine will? Does it say divine will, generic divine will? No. What does it call it? It calls it the will of the Father, right? So, the divine will is the will of the Father, the work of the Father, right? Um the, the, it, it's it, everything that the Son has and, and the Holy Spirit has. When, the, when Scripture says this, Scripture isn't just like making colorful statements to sound cool. It really is saying that the Father is the one source of everything in a divinity. So, of course, even in ad extra activities, it's the Father that's the source. But the mode in which He is the source is the divine nature because the persons share the same nature. And so, for example, when, when the world is created, we don't say that the world was created by three sources. The world was created uh, by God's energy, which was a movement of his will, proceeding, you know, as a divine procession, as St. Dionysius the Areopagite said, as a divine procession uh, from the divine nature, which is beyond being, right? The so divine energies are called processions in uh, St. Dionysius. Oh. So the principle of causation, which is a hypostatic power, well, that's, again, that's based on the Father alone. If the Son partakes of that, either he is a second principle or cause, which Roman Catholic theology rejects it, right? They say they reject it. But what is the basis of this, you know, co you know, the power of causality? Is it based on hypostasis or is it based on essence? If it's based on essence, again, there's a communion between the Father and the Son that the Holy Spirit is outside of. So the Holy Spirit is a lesser deity then by that logic if the communion is based on hypostasis again what is the what's the point of the communion between the father and the son in causing the holy spirit none it just causes a mixture between the father and the son right and this is why it's again this is why the Eucharist is untenable <clears throat> it cannot be accepted by the orthodox um the principle of everything is the person of the Father, as St. John of Damascus says. The mode in which the Father is the principle in divine activities is through the communion of essence. So this question establishes a false dialectic and opposition between person and nature. Many persons can make up one principle based on their commonality. Since the commonality of divine activities is the procession of divine energies from the divine nature, all the persons share in this principle. But the commonality of the Father's power to gen generate a divine person exists in his hypostasis only. If there is a communion between the Father and the Son on this point where the Holy Spirit is absent or is a mere effect of this communion, then what is this communion based on? The person of the Father or the divine nature? Well, the Carolingian theologians, some of the Carolingian theologians, uh, say, like Alcuin of York, uh, say that the Spirit was a product of God's will since they realized that if they said cause out it was a hypostatic power, they confused the hypostasis of the Son and the Father. So, for example, Alcuin of um, York says that the entire divinity is the first principle. 
And so there's still Roman Catholics that believe this, right? They think that the that the divine nature is the first principle. No, it's not. It's not. If the nature, if the divine nature is the first principle, if, if all the first, then that's tritheism, right? The Father is first principle. The Son is first principle. The Holy Spirit is first principle. Now, if you mean it in a purely ad extra sense, then okay, that's true. But that doesn't tell the full story. It doesn't tell the full story. That's incomplete. So, uh, Shisensky notes in his book on the Polyokwe, as was common for the Carolingians, the emphasis was always on the substantial unity of the three persons, most likely as God against the adoptionist threat. Alcuin's stress on the unity of the Godhead led him to attribute certain properties, example being being first principle, which in Eastern thought was reserved solely to the hypostasis of the Father, to all three persons within the Trinity. Thus, for Alcuin, while the Father was rightly called first principle and the Son first principle, yet there are not two first principles. The Holy Spirit is also the first principle, yet there are not three first principles, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but one first principle. Alcuin's language will certainly have sounded heretical to Greek ears, as it seemed to replace the monarchy of the Father with many principles within the Godhead, a charge that was to be hurled against the Latins for the next several centuries. So why is God one God? Because there is one principle, the person of the Father. That's why the Creed says, I believe in one God, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, I believe in one God, the Father. The Son is God of God. The Holy Spirit is worshipped with the Father and the Son. But before that, what does the Creed say? The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Or, you know, you can also be a complete idiot and say that uh, the Filioque was removed by the Greeks, when no one literally believes that anymore. <laughs> it's literally it's literally a historical fact that the Creed did not have the Filioque. So, like, this is not even contested. Like, if you're a Roman Catholic watching this, and it's, that's this historical fact, it's literally not contested. Only, like, like, fringe Twitter guys and Discord guys, like, make the statement. But who cares what they think? They're, they're just a bunch of dumbasses. Uh, historical facts are not below a, a Twitter guy, right? In, uh, and then, you know, returning to the Roman Catholic, making this argument. In short, in God, persons are relations. And as Thomas Aquinas says, the, there is a real distinction between the persons. He says, hence, there must be a real distinction in God, not indeed according to that which is absolute, namely essence, wherein there is supreme unity and simplicity, but, but according to that which is relative. So, although the persons are identical to the essence, they are not identical to each other. Thus, God is a trinity, and Filioque becomes a necessity. And my final point here is that to say that the Father equals God, and the Son equals God, and the Holy Spirit equals God, to then say the Father does not equal to the Son, the Son does not equal to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit does not equal to the Father, is just contradictory, right? And it's kind of like relative, right? This relative attribution to the persons. Um, it pretty much gets you into, again, a problem of, well, is this really even necessary? Does God have to have relative relations? Well, if your starting point is simplicity and your, your, your understanding of simplicity is the Neoplatonic doctrine of simplicity where distinction is opposition, then there is no point, right? It's just kind of contradicting the very thing that you're trying to defend. Um, but if you were to accept orthodox simplicity, you could speak of something being not composite while also having distinctions. Because isn't, for example, the soul simple? Well, yes, so the soul is simple, but yet it has distinctions, right? Memory, will, right? All of these things in the soul, they're all distinct from each other. They're also distinct from the soul. So the soul can have distinctions while rema remaining uh, in simplicity. And that the, the idea that the soul is simple, that's not my argument. That's St. Gregory the Theologian in his five theological orations. He says that, right? It's not a controversial statement to say that the soul is simple. Right? It doesn't have any parts, but it still has distinctions. So if the soul, if even created things can be simple and have distinctions, then naturally God can have. Right? But if God 
if God's will and his essence are identical, to kind of like restate the modal collapse argument, which is kind of like the main point of this video, then everything that God does, everything natural about God was also willed. But if it was also, if it was willed and natural, it becomes necessary. So again, we will say that it is natural for God to be creator because he has the power to create, but he actualizes that power in, you know, according to his free choice. But alternatively, if his will is the same as his divine essence, and this is the will that creates things, then anything that we can speak naturally of God is just necessarily true and necessarily actualized. So God necessarily is creator. So God necessarily have to be eternally creator in order to be creator. Um, I mean, the, the logic is, for example, like it's, it's similar with like for if God is a father, then the, then he has to have an eternal son, right? I mean, the, kind of like a similar far, argument, just applying it to God's attributes or energies, whatever you want to call them. Um, and since that being the case, uh, the the two options are either. God is not free. He's not freely creating things. Everything is necessary of God. That everything in life is necessary. Everything built in life is necessary. Everything happening in life is necessary. Uh, therefore, everything that we can speak of in reality is just necessary. It just necessarily had to be the way it is. It was all necessarily built by God. When you had this kind of a metaphysic, it's really not that surprising how Calvinism came afterwards. Right? Because Collins pretty much basically says, kind of just says, yeah, everything that happens is built by God, double predestination and all that. Um, even Luther, like, there, you know, Luther, in a sense, affirmed free will, but also denied free will, right? Um, but again, if you make distinctions between these categories, then you can speak of, you know, what is natural for God as not being compelled or forced. And so the orthodox alternative does not lead to a moral collapse. It doesn't lead to a filioque. It doesn't lead to these mental gymnastics. It leads to a sound patristic theology that is also really not that complicated and simple. And so I know some people are not going to like that because they're like, oh, orthodox, you know, all these Eastern schismatics, <clears throat> Eastern schismatics, their theology is like very simple. They're not an advanced and smart like I am. The, the theology is too simple. So it's just schematics. They're all just really stupid and dumb. They got bad arguments, even though like I can't respond to the arguments. They all are very really simple and like um, I'm like we like like we're like better than the church fathers, dude, because the church fathers weren't advanced like we are. So we can we know scripture better. That's basically how these people act. I literally saw someone on Twitter like literally say that. <laughs> he said that we're better than the church fathers because we have the internet. Uh, freaking nincompoop. So you have the internet. Oh, we have the internet. So we're more intelligent. We're more advanced. I mean, it's like, how are you different than an atheist, dude? Like, what the heck are you talking about? Uh, but you know the you know it there these people are all really the same people i mean atheists um you know the reformed people that, that have that defend this these doctrines in, incessantly i mean of course i'm not saying anything to roman catholics that might not know about this kind of stuff and they were like you know oh i don't get it it's too be too big brain for me i mean that's kind of the point right but another like point that i would make is that well um if the the if the thing that you pride yourself in is that your arguments are really advanced, then first of all, I mean, um, doesn't scripture say that? Does it? Does, isn't there a prayer in scripture where it is where it thanks God that wisdom has been taken from the wise and to babes? I, I saw that on Twitter. I wanna. Um, like, doesn't scripture say that? And I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but I mean, scripture pretty much says that. Uh, oh, there we go. Yeah. All right. Let me look at it. Yeah. It's Matthew 11, 25. 
At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. So if, you, if, if your pride is that I'm really, really advanced and smart, first of all, you're not. But second of all, if that's your pride, well, um, you're following a different gospel. I'm sorry, but you have a different gospel, bro. You're not following the gospel of Christ. Um, and I'm not trying to alternatively say that, oh, we got to be very simple and dumb everything down. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying that if you constantly have to say you're not advanced, right like other religious views i think that's just a sign of insecurity and that just has nothing to do with whether a religious view is true or whether a religious view is false this like and like this idea that we have to have the super smart people i'm a, hey guys i'm super smart i sit at home every day and i read text and books i'm 15 years old i'm a really intelligent guy i make posts on twitter and discord every day and i go on youtube and i make very smart high iq statements and I read like really smart people and I'm really unfunny guy, but I also make some stupid, funny, silly stuff because I'm a fun person. Ha! Huh? But uh, yeah, like that's the, that's the best thing. That's what God wants me to be. God wants me to be the smart person. And uh, you should listen to me because I'm the smart guy and you're not the smart guy. Like if that's the, like, that's your best thing, that's the best thing you have, right? That's the best thing you have. Then you're kind of just saying, the the, the 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 fate understanding the fate is just specifically for the smart people well that's not really the case uh the fate can be experienced by stupid people too that's why we have fools for christ are you gonna say that the fools for christ that you know better than the fools for like let's say like uh um what's an example of a pre-schism fool for christ and let's say let's say saint barsanufius of the danube river like let's just make up Someone, for example, for this case of an example, right? Fifth century is a very holy man. He very like exemplifies the life of the gospel. Both the West and the East adore and love him. And then you're gonna have in the 21st century guys saying, uh, "You guys don't understand God. You're not smart enough like me." Uh, you're gonna have guys saying stuff like that. <laughs> so you're basically saying these fools for Christ. You know better than them. But if that's the case, then first of all. Uh, you are, your mindset is that of a Aryan Eunomian mindset, but it also is of a Gnostic mindset because it's pretty much, you pretty much basically that, that pretty much leads to, um, only I can process and know the true fate and what it is. Right. And I do this by my own effort and research, but that's not how Christianity works, bro. It's not how it works. God revealed himself to us and by, or by, the measure that each individual person can handle, we are told to understand uh, and appreciate God in our own modes of being. That's pretty much what it is about. So uh, that's pretty much all I have for the stream. And I seem I got a super chat. And it's not show. Sure. Oh my goodness! I got a second super chat. And it's not showing. I don't know why it's doing that. I, I'm just going to have to scroll up. Up, up, up. All right. Okay, Rachel Wilson, $5. Thank you, Rachel Wilson. Also, uh, I'll be I'll be reading your book very soon. But um, she says, Thanks for this. In my Protestant background, I heard several false interpretations of the Trinity even in the same denomination. Yeah, I mean, Protestants, for example, um, they, don't, they don't care about having kind of like a unified belief in this kind of stuff. But they don't have like a normative belief system. Uh, it, the Protestantism is just, uh, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a joke. Uh, Ultra Radical Centrist says, as Terry Davis will say, a genius loves simplicity, an idiot loves complexity. That's so true, actually, because com like com unnecessary complexity is just Talmudic trickery. That's kind of what it is. Just, like, for example, let me give you let me give you a great example of this, right? And this is kind of how like some of these online philosophy theology pros are acting like. The, uh, for example, you look at what should I call it? The the Unix, modern day Unix. Uh, the modern day Unix, there's a, there's a meme that they that they put. I saw them post 
where it's like explaining gender theory to fellow eunuchs. And it's, uh, it's a picture of Aristotle and, you know, the classic picture of Aristotle and Plato debating with each other and all this kind of stuff, right? It's that picture, it's that meme. And then explaining gender theory to cishet, you know, people. And it's like a man reading from a book, like explaining things to a baby. And it, they're basically like the point of the joke is that gender theory is really complex, but they don't even engage. How are you so smart? We're so smart. It's like, like, yeah, I mean, I can create something completely imaginary and like develop a massive theory. That doesn't mean that it's true or that it's worth anything. Like I can create a, uh, I can create an alternative, like, I don't know, Lord of the Rings universe. Uh, well, Lord of the Rings actually is more useful than, um, you know, uh, meme online theology. But still, I could just create my own little universe just for myself. And I say, well, oh, you know, and some guy says, well, hey, wait a second. You have unicorns standing on one leg and uh, talking like fish and human beings can understand. That's the, like, how does that work? You know, it's like we can like. You, you, the, there are chairs and they're like all of the chairs have like you know seven legs and <laughs> and they're like walk around like spiders and like like this universe doesn't make any sense bro like what did, what did you do like you know like all of these things relating to each other like what, what the heck and I like, like it's like me saying mm. you're too stupid you don't get it <laughs> like it's but that's how these people act you're too stupid you don't get it you're not your, your theology is not as advanced and smart as mine like your gender theory is not a smart and advanced. No, our gender theory is very simple. And it's the true one. It doesn't have to be more complex, right? It's the same kind of idea. Just further gender theory kind of stuff, like this kind of a mindset. And as I said at the start of the stream, really, when you adopt a position independent of what has been revealed, because really the filioca, what it really is about is better we can accept creedal confessions from the past and move it on to the future without change, or whether we think that we have the power to change some things about it and just like make up our own stuff, right? Really, that is pretty much what is like what's at stake. If you're a filioquist, you believe in the evolution of doctrine. You believe in Henry Newman's idea of doctrinal development. You believe that as time progresses, you can come to a better understanding um, of, you know, of dogma, that dog, that, or that dogma can become better understood, or that you can, you know, you can, a thousand years later, you can look at a creed and say, you know what, I don't like this. Let's, uh, let's change it a little bit. Uh, of course, there, you know, uh, the one thing, the one good thing I will say about the Roman Catholic Church is that they do, um, really try to defend uh, the way they understood. They really try to defend the dogma uh, of, you know, the pre-schism church as best as they could. But it didn't work because even one minor infraction like this on the creed where I'm just going to innocently say, and the son. <laughs> like even something like that, something very minor like that, what comes out afterwards? Protestantism didn't come from the Orthodox Church. There's a very good reason why it didn't. And it's not because we were invaded by the Turks. It didn't come out in Russia either. The reason why Protestantism came out in the Roman Catholic Church is that the grounds for Protestantism, which is questioning what was dogmatically received and basically basing your theological understanding of, ah, we, we, we know better than the past. Or like basing dogmas on the opinion of an individual father. And that's another problem, right? If the opinion of the view of an individual father, like for example, St. Augustine or Thomas Aquinas, right? If their theologumena can be adopted as dogma, even though they themselves don't want it to be dogma, then doesn't that mean that every single dogma can also be treated as just merely a theological opinion? Well, yes, it can. And this is why you have, for example, the change in death penalty what, what is the Roman Catholic understanding of what is dogma? Well, if the Pope teaches on faith and morals, well, death penalty is about the faith and morals. So, But at, it's not dogmatic. But it's faith and morals, and the Pope teaching faith and morals is dogmatic, and the Catechism teaches about the Roman Catholic faith, but the Catechism is 
wrong and it's not dogmatic, but it teaches about the faith and morals of the Roman Catholic faith, which the Pope makes the statement. And according to Roman Catholicism, the papal statements are, is the Pope teaching faith and morals. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, right? doesn't make it a lot of sense. But, like, I can say that, like, again, I admire the desire to keep to the tradition, but the, the minor infraction that you have showcases that you can't, that you didn't, right? And this is why you have the innovated Filioque doctrine, which leads to various different theological problems, as I've spoken of in this video. So, as I said, I'm going to get into the history of it a lot and get into the theology of it a lot, but again... Uh, we will be getting into some of the more specific aspects of theology as time goes on. Um, streams like this, they're very stressful to me, all right? Like, uh, they're, they're kind of very stressful to me because um, I don't want to, like, make a bad statement or a wrong statement going off of, you know, memory because people are very pick picky about that stuff. I can already guess there's going to be people that's going to be like, oh, David is an idiot. He said this got this thing wrong. But, um, you know... Can't uh, can't fit over every egg or whatever uh, Armstrong says. So, uh, I'll see. I'll see. Uh, do we have any other super chats? We don't. But um, it seems like yeah, this this stream is pretty much pretty much that will conclude the stream or or what I had in mind for this video. And there's a lot of lot of good things that uh, I have in mind. One thing that I wanted to yeah so. Uh, right, the, the will of God is the same as the object of the will of God, which duplicates the origin is problematic in the medieval disputes over the operations of God outside himself. Let's add extra. There is no distinction between theology and economy, which means to predestine is to foreknow, and to foreknow is to predestine, which means God predestines some to sin because he foreknows their sins. And that's what, how we get Calvinism. So this is, or God is your dialectic, how you know, Dr. Farrell explains, I think this is in volume two, how he explains that, you know, from the filioque you get to this, right? So that's why, like, presentations, PowerPoints are much better. But anyways, I'll take my leave. It was a pleasure edutaining all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, see you probably tomorrow, actually. Probably tomorrow. I'll see you all. Thank you for watching. Goodbye. God, may God be with you and take a look at the description for the links if you want to support the channel, etc. And